I Wanna Jump Like Dee Dee with me, Giles Sibold, is the music podcast that does music a bit differently. I'm talking to some incredible musicians, DJs and producers about how they use an experimental mindset to fuel their own creativity, pursue new challenges, overcome fears, bounce back from mistakes. This is a this is a bit of a first, bit of a unique situation. We've we've come back for um, a second episode with Zia, and uh, welcome to Zia. Hi. Hey. So last time we kind of uh, talked about well, I think we we kind of got through about half of what we were gonna gonna get through, and yeah, um, I tend to ramble yeah. on. So, you know, we, we kind of, we, we, you know, we're going to limit it now. Basically, like two questions, 30, 30 minutes each. No, no go ahead. I'm only kidding. No, I'm going to do that now. <laughs> I will so, have forgotten so, the question you asked five minutes in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so last time we were, we were kind of talking about, um, you know, some of these sort of formative influences. So we kind of talked about, you know, the, the sort of the counterculture, um, you know, sort of environment that you grew up in. Um, you know, we talked about some of the stuff that you're doing, like your ceramics, welding, you know, playing clarinet, um, and, you know, also, you know, kind of acting as a sort of, I don't know, sort of by default, almost like a sort of spokesperson for kids when you were growing up who didn't have, have the voice. Sure. But before we get into some of the, how that kind of helped shape some of your creative uh, endeavors in the music industry, um, you did touch on... Uh, a, a very intriguing story, which we we didn't kind of go into, which is this uh, story in Manchester about the merch when you were touring there. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if that is something that you want to sure go into. Uh, I I of course have cannot remember what what we talked about in the last one because I've done several since then and yeah, you know, goldfish memory. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah. But with that, so when I got in the band, um, the nickname Secret Agent McCabe was um, what they started calling me pretty early on. And it started yeah. with when Peter's parents were out of town. Uh, so we had he had his parents' place for about six weeks when I first joined the band. Yeah. The solar heated pool and we, you know, dropped acid and played concerts and drank wine out of the wine cellar. It was really fun. And we started to have really big parties there. Mm. And so I would be the first one in the pool naked. And this would establish that this is gonna be, you know, a big fun naked pool party. And that yeah. became the kind of secret agent McCabe stunt, the, the first one. And so being this sort of um, person that kicks off the party, uh, there, there's these different applications of the nickname. And one of them also became kind of who's gonna advocate for the band if they're getting screwed over by somebody, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. like uh, you know, Led Zeppelin had their manager with the baseball bat. So that that became somehow my role. And uh, so if a venue tried to short us, um, I would be the one. I think it became my role because I was so less likely to get hit. Yeah. You know, if the guys came in and started to, you got to do that, then it just becomes, he's just going to send in the biggest security yeah. guy. Yeah, yeah. So it's just sort of, you know how it's going to end. But with me, they're just like, uh, <laughs> like my voice is shrill and I'm like not letting up on why we deserve what we deserve and how they're pieces of shit for like trying, you know, and the whole <laughs> shaming and not stop talking and I won't get out of the doorway and just, just annoy them until they cooperate is, was kind of the strategy. So like, kind of like an alternative enforcer, that kind of. Yeah, they're like, she is mind, yeah. never gonna shut up until we pay her. Oh my god! <laughs> so, so, and that is fairly effective, right? <laughs> it's, it's like, it's like what your kids do—they wear you down until you're like, oh my god, shut up and put this ice cream in your mouth. So that's like, <laughs> shut up and take the money is how we, you know, would get through those situations. And uh, running the merchandise that became a big point of negotiations for me, where. Mm negotiating percentages, um, what's fair, how, how does this all work? And in, is, was, it, was it Manchester or Liverpool? I think you said, yeah, it was Manchester, yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, I get those two confused. Sorry, England, that's an American thing. Um, yeah. I know them when I'm there. <laughs> as soon as I leave, they're like interchangeable. So we, we played that, there's like a university there that bands play. Yeah. 
yeah. I believe. And Courtney's girlfriend, it's like kind of, she's also like a little sassy Southern girl. She had come in and was like, there's all these, there's these guys selling bootleg merchandise. Everyone in Manchester understands this. It's part yeah. of the, it's, it's a sanctioned thing, right? <laughs> the venue knows it. The venue's probably getting a cut from the street vendors, right? Like everyone's in cahoots yeah. and the bands yeah. just like, don't get to sell their merch, which we really need that income yeah, yeah, yeah. to get to the next town. Like it's, we're just, you know, somebody's taking a piece at every angle and yeah. this one really offends me. And so she came in and the band, the rest of the guys just sort of rolled their eyes and are like, all right, whatever. And I go out there um, and I, I see that this is happening and she, you know, she comes and shows me where it's happening. So I just start taking the merch from the guy and just giving it to the fans. I just pulled as many <laughs> as fast as I could and just started chucking at the, at the audience. And he's getting madder and madder. And I'm like, no, you don't get to do this. This is my band, my image, my money to make. Yeah, not yeah. Your. I mean, you can imagine what I'd say. It's, it's cl so clearly wrong to do this. <laughs> yeah. And he's getting madder and madder. And, but the thing that I noticed that was so odd was the entire audience, which is my fans, had mm. just gone like this. Oh, really? Oh man, they were not getting involved at all. And so they backed up into this huge ring around us. And I'm like, what the? Uh, this is solidarity. <laughs> yeah, why aren't these guys like yeah. in any way taking my side? It's so obviously that I'm the right. Yeah. yeah. They're terrified, right? They're like, oh fucking hell, this is like not gonna go well. Because you know, the the merchandise bootleggers are basically gangsters yeah and yeah it's not like some chump in his mom's basement who made some shirts this isn't this is a form of organized organized crime. yeah and yeah. <laughs> i'm just pissed and i'm right and so i'm not thinking about anything about i'm not even looking at these guys to size them up or see if they're scary i don't fucking yeah. care right i'm not like getting ready to get in a fight i'm just telling them off and they can shove off and they're not shoving off at all. <laughs> and they're, they're getting angrier and angrier. And of course I am too, and more confused because you're like in your peripheral picking up little bits of information that doesn't quite align with the way yeah. you <laughs> yeah. somehow imagine things to go in the few seconds it took you to get there. And the the Courtney's uh, girlfriend at the time is kind of hollering in the background, sort of like, she's got my back, right? And she's like chirping in. And this guy like pulls his fist back and I'm like, this is going to get serious. Oh, and oh. that girl charges him, jumps up around his arm like a monkey and is hanging off of his, his pulled back arm that's ready to, <laughs> he's like, don't you touch her. And so she's kind of swinging off the end of this guy's arm, <laughs> standing there again going, what the fuck is going on? And so I just started cussing like a sailor, fuck your mother, fuck the people that raised you. Just like yeah. I am, I've had it now. Yeah, and she yeah. starts to gather what's left of the merch and leave. Wow. And, and cause he's like, this woman's hanging off him. I'm screaming at him. The whole audience has got about 15 feet of safety distance yeah. away from this yeah. scene. And he starts going down the street and I'm just like laying into him every cuss word. He turns around and spits hits hits me right in the face with his spit and i'm Shit. like yeah no this is what I had this was an ugly scene Shit. and i was like he goes i'll fucking see you in london and i'm like oh really oh really and so we go back into the venue oh. and i i don't know if i refuse to pay them because i could tell everybody's in on this together and yeah. we're well aware of what's happening so when i got to london I went straight to the to the people who handle the merch and settle everything. And I said, if one shirt gets sold outside that's not official merchandise, one, you get nothing. You get mm. no commission. Mm. This is absolutely not okay to be in yeah. cahoots with these guys that takes a cut. You're already taking yeah. a rapey level of, of yeah, cut yeah. commissions, mm. which you have a business license that we work underneath. I understand ha mm. having to pay you a cut, um, but no. 
I'm not, I'm not doing it. And I sent my own bootleggers outside to sell our stuff that we sell inside outside. Inside, outside. Yeah. Yeah. Not give them a cut. Well, I'm like, fine. You let those guys sell outside. We'll just sell our own shit. Yeah. So I had, you know, my own bootleggers outside selling merch <laughs> outside the London show. And they may be the only show in history that there wasn't a Manchester bootlegger team outside. Of <laughs> and then my friend calls me and goes, you're in the Manchester newspaper, Zia. I cannot believe you tried to take oh those guys God. on. What the hell were you thinking? I'm like, how the fuck should I know? How did I know that I was taking on the, the Al Capone of merchandise? Yeah, yeah. Like, I had no idea. They, those guys, it's London, right? England, so they probably didn't have guns. But like, I really was walking into something that yeah. like any yeah. local would have known better. So I came out okay. I taught everyone a lesson, hopefully, and like set some sort of example that artists really do need yeah. to stand up for themselves a little better. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> but oh my yeah, gosh, so wow. That happened. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, I'm, like in terms of creativity, that's 10 out of 10. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely top draw. That is... <laughs> I thought that putting the old, my own bootlegger outside was pretty creative. That's true. <laughs> I I'm think like, we should, I'm to sell you guys. I think one of the things I've been talking about, like, is kind of gut instinct and stuff like that. And you just like, right, this this is wrong. This is just like you got. Let's just go and kind of sort this out. Yeah, wow. when 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 stuff feels, you know, just just morally wrong, I don't feel like I need to think twice about it. Yeah, I really trust yeah, myself yeah. to sort of jump in the fray. But man, looking back on some of those situations, because of course that's not the only story I have like yeah, that. Yeah. I look back on it and go you came really, out it could have gone so yeah. much worse every time yeah, yeah. and i and i think the difference is is because they know i'm right mm. i'm looking them in the eye and saying what you're doing is wrong yeah yeah, yeah. And this is bad and you should feel bad about it and you should make some course corrections in your life because this is not okay and i'm going to call yeah. you out so yeah. yeah i'm protecting myself and protecting my partners or whoever it is i mean it, I've been inside someone else's minivan stopping a neighbor from whooping on his girlfriend, you know? And so yeah, well, yeah. I didn't think twice again, I should not have been getting involved to that level. But when it's wrong and they know they're wrong, there's something that it, it takes away some of their mm. power because all of a sudden they, yeah. they're having to deal with the con the ethical conflict inside them, yeah. which, which, which pulls their own punch for them mm. and uh and that's i think why i you know have gotten away with really more than i should have yeah yeah wow well that i think that was uh, that was that was worth the entrance fee already wasn't it there we go yeah yeah it's a, it's the best kind of adrenaline rush is when you're when you're out there protecting justice yeah. and yeah <laughs> Like you say, when you get that kind of peripheral sort of vision, these these kind of things that you just sort of sense that are going on outside, and it's like, hang on a second, am I on my own here? Yeah. Why is everyone backing away? Yeah. Like, Stop this guy, oh, right? Well, am I right? Yeah, right. I've got to go. Yeah. Because you're like, where? What am I getting wrong here? Yeah. I know yeah. This guy's wrong, and I'm right. What is? Yeah. It, oh, because these guys are scary and dangerous. Yeah, scary and dangerous. Yeah. In retrospect. <laughs> so, um. Like when we when we spoke last time, I think we we kind of started out that that you were sort of brought up in a, a um, you know kind of counterculture you know sort of environment. What I mean, what in terms of sort of music creativity, how uh, how do you think that what sort of role did that play in you know kind of um, yeah in, well you know in, in 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 the creativity that you've you've sort of shown in in your music career. Um. I think that the the most straightforward would be um, just never ex being expected to conform. Mm. You know, if you're raised, most people are raised in, to some level of conformity. Yeah. Right. You mm. you need to you know respect your elders and listen when mm. adults tell you what to do and and you know all these little things that we're taught that are sort of funneling people into this um, life of cooperation and conformity, which works really good for the workforce. Yeah, right? yeah. That's what our school system obviously is, is to make people good workers. Mm. And uh, I was raised just quite literally the opposite of that. Mm. I got in trouble if I conformed without question. Yes, right? yes. And, and yeah. 
So, and, and there's a sense of conforming that's really beautiful and nice. It's about all being in community, right? But, mm. but um, there, it's a different thing. And so conforming without question um, was something that was a no-no for, mm. for me growing up. And I think that that really lends itself to creative freedom, mm. right? Did, because uh, yeah. you're not coloring inside the lines. Yeah. I mean, did, did that did that kind of like help say with, um, you know, kind of when you when you're sort of crossing that that line into the more conformist space? So let's say that, you know, you're, you're, you're in the band and you're, you know, for example, talking about record deals. So you're talking about, you know, sort of record labels or ways that producers work with you and stuff like that. Did that did that sort of feed through into you kind of challenging those norms, those those sort of ways of doing things? Uh Hmm. Well, when I started in the band, I had no idea about any of that stuff. Mm. Right? So, so Courtney just um, was sort of in charge of everything. Yeah. And so what I kind of let him do was set the, set the stage for mm. how we were going to run and operate. And he seemed to be as anti-conformist as I was. And yeah. so with labels and record deals, I think what we did was just kind of made a lot of enemies mm. because we were more adhering to anti-establishment and anti-authority mm. almost just for the sake of doing it, right? right? Like at some point, these are establishments that are that can benefit you if you can find a way to navigate them. Yeah. And so there's there's still some cooperation that mm. could be very beneficial and not without conforming. And I don't know that we really walked that line to the best. Well, mm. we probably did to the best of our abilities, but, but there's always ways you could have done it better. Ways of doing it, yeah. yeah so, I, so I think in some respects, we probably shot ourselves in the foot a few times mm. by just being kind of bratty children and not cooperating really at all. Yeah. But the essence of protecting our creative freedom and protecting our choices and not bending to the wills of non-creative executives mm. who clearly don't know what they're talking about. Mm. Um, I think that we protected that, that essence, even though in some ways we probably shot ourselves in the foot, we ultimately didn't ever sacrifice who we were. Mm. If we want to lay in, uh, awake at night in bed and think of the mistakes that we made. At least we never made that one. Yeah, you know, yeah. There's a lot of bands that I wonder how they sleep at night when all of a sudden it looks like they're clearly doing whatever the label tells them. Yeah, yeah. And we're not the monkeys. What was I mean? I mean, what kind of value did that have for you? Was that was that like you, you know just having that? ability to sleep at night knowing that you know kind of morally you've stood your ground you've you've stood with what your kind of values are what you believe in um how did that help us <laughs> yeah i mean how, how, how did that i mean was that a, a sort of was that something that that was such a positive for you that that you know you can kind of said okay we might not have got this, but we kind yeah, of, I mean, I think for the most part, ground. it was well, there was very thrilling aspects of that. Okay, for example, uh, Capital wanted us to come down to LA to shoot a video, mm. and of course, they're going to spend I don't know if you saw our early videos, they're going to spend a stupid amount of money on this video, yeah, and, yeah. and uh, all on all on temporary sets that are going to go in a dumpster. So that bothered me too. The what, what LA spends on set design and stuff that this yeah, just just crazy yeah. and still yeah that that is yeah. sickening actually. And so we said no, we're from Portland. We're a Portland band. We're gonna do. Mm. Uh, it was a photo shoot set of photo shoots. And I said we're now we're gonna do our our photos up here. We decided, and so they cut our budget by like two down to a third. We were mm. like, that's fine. That budget was obnoxious right so maybe it was eighty thousand dollars for photos and now it's twenty thousand. i mean it was just so wow. stupid the amount of money Crazy. so we had nigel this this british photographer the imperial nigel came and it was when we were making 13 tales so he came up and we had a blast 
we went to a giant antique flea market bazaar and he took pictures of us buying antique jewelry and velvet couches, <laughs> looking at lamps. And that was the photo shoot. And we took all this stuff home with us. We're like, yeah, look what we yeah. bought while the photo was being taken. Or we all got vintage kimonos and, and went and had Japanese food. And there, there's some really cute photos of that. <laughs> I'm trying to think of what other stuff. I mean, we did all kinds of shit and it cost like nothing. Yeah. And the very end of it, with the money that was left, I had just bought this house. The basement was still dirt with plastic mm. on it. So you could have as big of a party as you want. They're not kind of hurt yeah. anything. So we had this rager. We spent 500 bucks on booze. We had, you know, a couple of eight balls of blow, 100 hits of ecstasy, <laughs> 10 cartons of cigarettes two door guys that um, would only let you in if you were dressed formal or unusual. And we had the party of the year with the rest of the, the money from this. Yeah, the money. I mean, yeah. I don't ever want to go to a party that fun again. It was too, too much, but uh, it was epic. And that was us sticking it to the man, you know, mm. like we took that money. We don't need all your money, just some of it. And we'll do it our way and and really give a superior product that's authentic and interesting and unique to us and yeah. not some canned LA rock star photo shoot that every band uh -huh. you you can replace the band and keep the same background, right? Uh -huh. So that was our our way of being independent and not just cooperating. But of course, we probably pissed somebody off because we didn't do it the way they wanted. The way so they now, wanted, yeah. Now we've got somebody down in the office. Rather than just seeing like the artists are individuals and should come up with their own ideas and plans and aesthetic, and the, no, they get offended that we didn't cooperate, and so it did cause subsequent issues of. Mm you know, not not being supported or promoted in the way that like the good little mm. boys and girls get that do what they're told. Yeah, yeah. Was it worth it? Absolutely. We're not, I mean, you know, yeah, but I'm sure there yeah. was some, I'm sure there were some compromises we could have made mm. that would have had those guys also feel seen and valued that we didn't give a shit if they felt seen or valued because <laughs> if they talk like that in the 90s. <laughs> We didn't give a safe space for the label people to yeah. have their creative input too. So we, we didn't have clear boundaries established. It was just the clear middle finger. That was it. Absolutely. <laughs> fuck off. It's our way or the highway. Yeah. And they were like, you know, and eventually dead then we weren't on a major label anymore. And we had to be creative on a much smaller budget. Fine. No regrets. Yeah. See, I mean, the, you know, the, like the, the, the band as, um, you, you know kind of created some um very very kind of well d diverse records you know in terms in terms of style and I, and I i you know i really kind of d I dislike you know putting bands into into genres you know and, and i don't think you actually can put the dandy warhols into into a genre anyway it's it's really tricky it, it's irrelevant and but i don't think you can anyway yeah, I mean, we have a sound, and no matter how different each record sounds from the other record, there is still a, yeah, there is still a sound that we have, and you know, that's that's something you really only totally understand when you look in retrospect. I yeah. mean, how grungy is Rule OK? We thought we were making like the sexiest. <laughs> <laughs> you listen to it, go, oh, that's definitely the '90s, and that is still in the heart of grunge. But to us, it wasn't compared to how grungy. Yeah, really are. Yes. So there, it's funny how it can be totally our sound, but still very crunch. And then we can have one that's totally our sound, but still very, <laughs> very psychedelic and much more shoegazy than the other ones. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's always our sound and our sound and. Yes, yes, that's 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 very true. Yeah. Um, I mean, did, did the you know sort of the you know yes, you've got you've got your sound and and, the, and those and bits. The, the ones that really kind of veered, you know, from, from record to record. I mean, did, did, is, was, was this something that, you, you know, is a, is a mindset thing that it's okay, well, we want to do something just different, you know, to kind of keep this kind of creativity flowing? Yeah, well, I mean, if you try to do that, it's very hard because you're thinking of a not. You're like, mm -hmm. I'm going to not do this. How do I be different than this? And then, and, and off you go mm. into the void. Like, how mm. do you get it? That's like a creative 
death if you're trying to yeah. have an idea but um you when you think of it as in what do i miss what am i not hearing what do, what am i okay like if you're making dinner you don't go well i guess you could not steak again you mm. that's not usually yeah. how we think of the next meal unless you've had you made way too many leftovers but you mm. usually think Ooh, I want pasta. I haven't had pasta and ever that you think of what you're missing, what you're craving. Mm. And so that's the approach that we have to our, what gets us going for the next record. What's good. Mm. So if it is guitar, 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 what do we want? We want keyboards. Where's all the synth stuff. And so yeah. like, welcome to the monkey house was this reaction to this, you know, guitar wave and, yeah. and well, 13 tales was a reaction to a synth wave, right? Like yeah, yeah, yeah. Our guitars. And mm. so it's, what are we hungry for? Mm. And then when we go in to make the record, a couple of things happen. One, we don't think about our sound. Our sound is our sound. We mm. don't know how to not sound like us. Mm. So we need to be as creative as we want to be and try to make whatever it is we said we're going to set out to make to varying degrees of success. It's still going to sound like us. It's our same amps. It's our same mm. guitars. It's our same keyboards. And it's our same fingers, you know, mm. it's the and our same emotions. So all of that stuff creates the common sound. And then there's that inspiration that gets you excited to make another record and that gives you a direction to go in. Mm. Um, and then beyond that, there's a couple of things that come into play. And this is a thing that people get really confused with, with creativity. When you have an idea or an inspiration, that does not mean that the end piece is gonna be anything like what you started with. Yeah. And people who get attached to that, the, whatever inspires you great you're inspired go 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 there's inspiration use it up it, it's a thing that evaporates if you don't use it so mm. use for inspiration but the thing that inspired you doesn't have to be this rigid partner that yeah. rides along with the inspiration so we might go oh yeah we are totally making a goth record that we're so excited oh yeah we're so we're gonna goth it out man, it might end up a fucking folk record. Yeah, It doesn't yeah. matter yeah. Mm -hmm. as long yeah. as you keep juicing that inspiration to keep you creating, create, create. Don't judge, yeah. don't, don't pick it apart. Just keep throwing the shit out there until you've got a body of work mm -hmm. that you can now, now your job isn't mm -hmm. to think of what inspired you and force it back into this confines of a goth idea yeah, oh yeah. we said we were making a goth record yeah well we we didn't though yeah. listen to it because now it has a life of its own and mm. you have to respect what was created so mm. now we listen to this record that we were so inspired by goth music and so so into it and we listen to it and go oh goodness it's not really a goth record at all it's it's actually so much more it's it's dark folk so let's now honor it for what it is and and do the last finishing bits to really make what it what it's trying to be shine rather than force it to be something else because it doesn't fit our idea yeah and i think that that's where so many creative ideas crash and burn is because you get attached to the container mm. that was only there to breed your inspiration it wasn't there to to conform with what came later right this is what yeah i mean this is a great point i mean the, the, this is what i like about uh, when when i was you know look, looking at this business you know the sort of the you know the idea of an experimental mindset what that actually means <clears throat> i was looking at you know kind of the kind of process that like a scientist goes through and scientists do not get obsessed by the outcomes because they don't know what it's going to be that's the whole no. kind of point and of how many things do they discover <clears throat> all of the great discoveries were by accident while they were trying to do something absolutely. else absolutely that's creativity <clears throat> that yeah. is that is how you honor creativity is is keeping that peripheral open yeah because the laser focus leaves out so many wonderful happy yeah. we live by the ethos of oops that's cool yeah and so yeah. you're trying to do a thing. And if you're so busy trying to do the thing, you missed out that you were actually doing this other amazing thing. Yeah. And I, th I think, I think in, 
for you know for in lo lots of parts of our lives and, and possibly more for the non-creative people and people who don't work in kind of creative um industries let's say <clears throat> you know the, the the kind of standard is to kind of get attached to outcomes you become a little bit obsessed with it, like i've got to have this by this time next year or or this and you become you you sort of focus your mind on that and, and all your your kind of actions on on that thing and it's you know it might work but it might not and if it doesn't work you're going to be you're going to be pissed off you know yeah. and and it's like you 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 know to to get sort of obsessed with that you know is is really not not healthy but we do it in, in no, society well, we, we do it it's like about goals you know we've got to have this goal. is to be conformist and goal oriented aren't we but yeah. the thing is you can apply these goals in a general type of structure as far as like I want to have 10 demos by this date. And Agreed. that is yeah. the way, and that's the kind of stuff that's in the um, the war of art versus the art of war. Yeah. The war of art is a great thing about how to be a disciplined artist. Mm. It's not that you discipline your style of creativity, you discipline the framework and the structure to make sure you're al always creating, even if you mm. don't really feel like it, because sometimes being grumpy and resentful about agreeing to be creative at a certain time poops out some other kind of thing that you weren't expecting. Mm. But that, so to say like, I need to have, you know, started four canvases or demoed eight songs, does give you a way because creativity is so ephemeral and so sort of slippery you you can't you can't box it right you yeah can't, yeah there's no canning it and saving it for when you need it which also means the days that you've agreed to sign up and be creative with somebody you might not be feeling it so there is a sense of discipline that can i i kind of imagine creativity as a faucet that if you turn off it will rest mm. And so yeah. you don't get to decide when it's coming out. It's also a faucet that has a kind of a, a you know, unpredictable supply, right? So it's not mm. like you leave it on and creativity is always pouring. And it's just always it. flowing, yeah, yeah. You leave it on and when it flows, you put a cup underneath it and do something with it right <laughs> away. And so, you know, these people who try to control their creativity as if it's a well that you can always decide when it comes out, I think set themselves up for disappointment too. I think it's a thing that you, like I said, it's ephemeral when it's there, mm. use it, do something with it. Don't boss it around too much. Yeah. I mean, having, having, I mean, having said all that, you, you know, I mean, I've, I've done it myself where, you know, I've, I've come up with an idea about something and it's become, you know, my, my, little baby you know it's like i'm i'm so into it i'm so into this thing and then when when somebody else takes a look at it they see it clearly from a different with it from a different perspective with a different lens on whatever mm -hmm. and 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 it, it's kind of it's hard sometimes to you know when when that's your thing to when when you when somebody looks at it and says well what about this what about that what about that stop kind of picking at things that's kind, of, that's kind of hard. Oh, for sure. You mean uh, somebody that you would consider like a collaborator and a peer or? Yeah, I mean, I mean, anybody that you would value, to, you know, for, for, for their for their opinion, you know, yeah, on something. I mean, and, and, there's, a, I mean, there's a few ways to like cope with that and look at it. I mean, one of the best things that Peter ever said to me, Lord of the Rings was big while we were making um, yeah. Welcome to the Monkey House. And Welcome to the Monkey House was also sort of my coming out record, right? I hadn't mm. played a band or an instrument really before I joined. And so yeah. Rule of A was literally, if the song was E-A-D, it's me going E-A-D. Like yeah. no creative input yet. Yeah. Mm. And then come down a little, maybe a passing note here or there, you know, still very, very timid mm. and and my job was to kind of just stay out of the way, right? Lay mm. a foundation in a drone and then get out of the way. And so between Come Down and Welcome to the Monkey House, wait, did we have 13 Tales between those? Okay, between mm. 13 Tales and Welcome <laughs> to the Monkey House, we went and we worked in the studio with Massive Attack. Did we talk about that in the last No, interview? we didn't, no, no. Okay, so this was huge for me. Yeah, For a yeah. couple reasons. 
one, I didn't go the first time. I got so, I self-talked myself right out of it, right? I was like, these are synth guys. They're going to know you don't know what you're doing. This is going to be humiliating. Don't go. And so I didn't go. And then, of course, I was even more mad at myself for being a puss. And I was like, you know what? You wouldn't be in this band if that was your attitude. If that was the way that you approached um, creative, scary creative opportunities, you wouldn't even be Mm. here. Shame on you. Mm. You are a totally privileged individual. And if you ever get a chance like this again, you're showing up no matter how scared you are. Yeah. Well, for whatever reason, we, like a month later, we had a, we were in, in a, was it Brighton or Bristol? In Bristol. 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 We're yeah, in yeah. Bristol again. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, well, here you go, dummy. You're, now you're going. So I showed <laughs> up, of course, just like, so like me. And uh, they're, you know, they're awesome guys. And yeah. they they put me in this room with little gel projectors and all the synths connected in through the same mixer coming out the same speakers. Mm. Great. I'd never, I had never to this day had time by myself to create music in a, in a safe space, Mm. right? Mm. There was somebody looking over my shoulder, waiting for their turn, hurry, hurry, uh, every single track I'd ever recorded yeah. and so I'm in this place by myself and they'd bring me a disc of whatever the you know rough tracks that the boys had started yeah. and I'm just in there tripping myself out wow. I, I'm like is this a is this a little melody over on this keyboard or ooh, is it a bass line and and then just kind of timidly bring my ideas into the main room and, and track yeah. a couple of the things I'd come up with which all became critical pieces that we built around in these tracks yeah yeah and so having that space that freedom that room to breathe that room to experiment which is what musicians are supposed to be doing and i had like not done that for a few years Mm -hmm. i also didn't take my instruments home and trip myself out so it's not like it's anyone's fault i just hadn't clicked yet Mm. right I, I was truly just along for the ride until that mm. experience with Massive Attack. Yeah. So for um, Welcome to the Monkey House, I insisted on this. Mm. So I had my own, it was an old office space anyway. So we just left one of the office rooms intact. And that was my new synth room. Right at the time that Courtney was really feeling inspired to lay heavy on synths. Like, you mm. know, we'd done a few guitar records and so had everyone else. Yeah. And So I got this opportunity to just go nuts. Mm. And, and of course, you know, Duran Duran came and played on that record and laid down some tracks and, um, you know, we we had quite a, quite a few cool guest musicians as well, but it was, it was my coming out record. I just Mm. had so much fun being really, really experimental. Here's your 30 minute answer. The the reason (laughs) that was, I just remembered what we were talking about. I was so on fire and laying down these tracks. So it was the first time I felt really invested in what I had contributed, yeah. which what, what follows that, right? The ego, the mm. ego's now involved. My ego had yet to be involved. And mm. so I would be like, yeah, that sounds like, yes, that sounds great. Listening to some work I'd done. And I'd come in the next day and it'd be deleted. I'd be like, well, what the fuck with that? And yeah. You know, I started a little like, "Mm," which every band member, ever musician goes through this when you're collaborating and and there's some pull on what works and what doesn't. Mm. And so I was complaining to Peter a little bit about it. And, you know, he's like, well, look, I mean, it didn't work with the direction the song was going. It has Mm. nothing to do with it being a good or a bad part. And I was still kind of like not really handling it that well. And he's like, Mm. look, yeah, we can't be precious Mm. about our parts. And so, like I said, Lord of the Rings was big. And you cannot treat your parts like that. Yeah. They're, they're something, like I said, the tap is flowing and you just bang them out. And then later you, you pay attention to what the song is trying to be mm-hmm. rather than trying to strong arm it into one thing or another. So mm-hmm. just because I laid down a few really cool tracks, it doesn't mean that they supported ultimately where the song was going to go. I mean, do, I mean, do, do you think? Do you think? I mean, do, those are really good examples. I mean, do you think that 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 sort of ego coming out, or the that that you know your reaction to that was? I mean, what did you put it down to? Was it was it kind of like uh, you you felt the need to be heard, the you know you, you wanted finally, to be accepted and yeah. Well, I think I finally contributed stuff that was 
my my voice coming out through yeah. these synthesizers where before I was just sort of doing what I was told. I you was just, just uh, yeah, I, okay. Yeah. I was playing my part. Yeah. Which was, was was actually just pretty fun and easy, right? And it was, it was yeah. the easiest few years of my life. And then I started to get creatively and emotionally involved. And like I need more. Learning, yeah, there's a learning process. And mm. of course my ego came out because I had produced something that was close to me. Mm. Um, and so then that creates a, an opportunity for growth and adjustment. And I learned to not be precious about my parts. I come in and I just fling those things out and I leave and they can do whatever the fuck they want with them. Mm. And whatever stays great, whatever it doesn't stay, I don't even remember that I made it. Mm. No, and so that's the way I do it now. And did, did you did you have to teach yourself to do that? Was that something you had to practice? I mean, maybe not not sort of sort of consciously, but just sort of subconsciously. It's like, okay, well, I need to kind of like remove myself a little bit and just it was create. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Peter saying that like you can't be precious. I mean, you picture Gollum who wants to walk around being that creep about their stuff. Yeah. yeah. So it was kind of immediate. I was like, oh. Yeah, you can't be precious. If I want to go yeah. and create every track myself and make my own music and not share and collaborate, which that's why we, you know, solo artists mm. do solo projects. Yeah, they, yeah. They maybe don't play nice with others or they don't want any input and they want this to be a pure unfettered expression of themselves, which mm. I think is, you know, artists that make an entire album, every track on their own has its own message that's... Mm. Um, What's that guy from Mag something magnetic and the sharps? His name's Alexander. Oh God, he had a band that I didn't listen to that uh, that I had never listened to, but his solo album that he did in rehab yeah. is beautiful. Yeah, and it's yeah. such a true sentiment of what that guy was going through that it didn't need collaboration because that was a truly solo, lonely journey and experience. Him. Yeah. yeah. But what freaks people out more is when humans can come together and collaborate mm. and, and the synergy that happens when you are able to make compromises, mm. but also that you get so on the same page with each other. I mean, I can't yeah. remember the last time that something I contributed didn't get used unless it really extremely went in a different direction. I just know what goes there now, mm -hmm. right? And so for me, it's just, I just mold those songs over. I had another breakthrough later on where I started to judge my work before I contributed. Yeah. And I started to get kind of insecure and it's not good enough and I could do better. Maybe I was at a little bit of a plateau growth wise. Mm. And I couldn't, I couldn't commit to anything that I was writing. And for what, you know, fuck it, I'm gonna get on Facebook for a while, this is too hard. And I'm like sitting there. And uh, um, uh, an Andy Warhol quote came up. I did actually get distracted. There was some text there. I'm like, hey, okay. <laughs> you can't. You she, can't she's, just, she's just on that phone just a little bit too long. <laughs> Your world brain kicked in. God damn it. So <laughs> where are we? What were we talking about? Oh, okay. So this, is a, this is a first. This is a first for me. One of my guests <laughs> has got distracted with text on a phone. Brilliant. Yeah, yeah. You're you're Ice killing gold. it. You're killing it. <laughs> so, when he, so an Andy Warhol quote came up, and he was basically talking about creativity and your role as a creator. Mm. And he's like, "Look, don't judge your stuff. That's not your job. That's a critic's job." or the person who's gonna buy it or not buy its job. Yeah, yeah. Your job is to create and then set it aside and then create something else and set it aside and create something else. No, the judging is not part of the process. It is it is the thing that rusts the faucet yeah, of creativity yeah. is judgment, self judgment. And so <laughs> to keep that you know flowing, you have to not, think of if it's cool or who's going to like it or who's not going to like it or can you do better you just yeah. make it you get out of your own way and you and you make it and so I did that with you know it's like four tracks and I just I I thought well this is a divine message from Andy Warhol right I clearly yeah. need to listen to this advice and I created 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 and I went and tracked all of those bass lines and and synth parts and I think every single one got so, so taking that advice from Andy Warhol has really, really helped me stay in flow creatively. I can just keep 
keep coming up with ideas and don't worry about if they're good or bad because they're just ideas. It's, this is really interesting because because today um, I put out um, an episode with that I'd recorded um, a while ago with Andrew Fern from Sleaford Mods, mm-hmm. and and he was he was saying um, I don't know if you know Andrew but he, he does the the he does the keyboards and the and the beats you know he's the um, you know the guy that that creates that and and he said you know he's, he, his his attitude and he, it was a quote that just left it, that really stayed with me today when I put it out and he said at the end of the day you can't force people to like your stuff Mm-mm. and it's like it's it's kind of as simple as that you mm-hmm. can't you can't force it you just you got to put it out there and see see what sticks well and here's the other thing that's really missing from from well the world but create doing something creative I think for for all people to be well balanced should be taught at every level, encouraged at every level. And I mean, I'm sure there's more than one famous quote, and I can't remember who said the one that I, that I had read, but it was it was basically about everybody should have creative outlets, mm. especially ones you're not good at. Mm. Especially yeah. ones you're not good at. Yeah. So, uh, so I am, you know, I've taken a beginning drawing class or, a, you know, I'm an amateur photographer. I mm. do all kinds of creative things that I, well, I don't feel like I'm terribly good at any of it, but just because it's such an important part of our, our well-being. Mm. And so if, if that creative, if, if there was space and encouragement for every individual from, from when they can hold a, a crayon, Mm. Um, on up Mm. then that whole thing of worrying about whether people like what you do or don't like you what you do I don't think would be such an issue I agree yeah because because we have we have put creativity into this little section that only some people have right which really isn't the way it's meant to be everybody has should have some sort of creative outlet and grow up not feeling judged by it it's just like running laps at the track you your body needs exercise you know math is good for your brain science is good for your brain languages are good for your brain music Mm. is good for your brain Mm. drawing is good for your brain you know and all these things create these you know well-balanced humans which good luck finding a well-balanced human right now right yeah yeah. lack of access to be creative and and undervaluing that time mm. to the point where it doesn't even exist in most schools right and yeah, most homes, yeah. most homes yeah. you know so many homes don't have musical instruments in them and so i think that having that be shrunk down to where it's something that you really have to fight to be you have to mm. fight to be creative you have to you have to fight to be respected for being creative and mm. so then then if it's not something you can sell it's not yeah. valuable and it, I agree. Should, yeah. it should be valued whether it fits a trend whether it's popular where wh- whether anybody likes it mm. um, and we tend to only value sellable creative stuff and i think with yeah with with sellable things i mean we, we again this is the, this this you know kind of putting things in boxes and, and compartmentalizing things it's like you know kind of what do you do that's got value and, and when it's when it's creative i think you mentioned it earlier it's a bit sort of ephemeral it's, it's it's harder to sort of put a it's hard to make it as tangible as say um um you know i'm a lawyer mm-hmm. you know you know exactly what you what you kind of get and i think now the the, the world has, has sort of shifted that much with the type of work that we that we all do you know kind of the, you know there's been obviously been a you know, kind of blurring of personal and work lives but yeah, sure. You know, sure. There are there are still those very well defined roles, but also there's just a this kind of burgeoning, you know, group of people that do different things and can't be sort of put into box. And that's that's kind of then I, I think our brains or the way that we've been kind of conditioned through society, we find it harder to attribute what value those type of people have for society because you you know with a lawyer that you know okay a lawyer's going to charge this amount this is what they're going to achieve for you and there's there's a kind of monetary value and we get we get sort of obsessed with that and it's kind of that's 
that's one of the problems I think that we that's that conformist factory style society that we've gotten into that's all about productivity yeah and, yeah. and much less about process right Absolutely. And, yeah. And, pleasure. Yeah. Mm. and it's one of the things that is making us so sick as a human race I feel mm. and 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 studies support that's not a far out concept um yeah. And it's unfortunate, right? But I, I think it's totally fixable within a generate. You just start having creative stuff be valued. There's, you know, yeah, there's always yeah. time for mindfulness and creativity in the school day. Yeah, and until yeah. there is in, in every school around the planet, some time for mindfulness and creativity, can mm. you imagine what that would do in one generation? Just, just, Absolutely. just one, you know? Absolutely, yeah. Um, and, uh, and I think it would change that that self judgment for being um, a creative person, because everybody would have a creative outlet, right? And then yeah. some people are just so good at it they get to be paid for it, and then, yeah. then the, the cream would rise to the top. But without such a, um, you wouldn't have to fight so hard to get there, right? You'd be yeah. there's a path laid out for. I mean, at least you guys have the doll. Yeah. Right. You yeah. you actually have some support for an unemployed artist. Mm. We, for the first time in the history of the United States, got the pandemic unemployment assistance, which actually supported economy and gig workers, which is the umbrella to which the artist falls under. Mm. And um, it's I mean, you wouldn't believe so many artists didn't even apply because they just thought that there was no nothing there for them because there never has been. You had to convince. Yeah artists that there is really some support for them right now during the pandemic mm. i mean we've we've had that I mean, I mean you know i think that i mean the pandemic is in, in a way sort of showed up um i mean you, you know here as well the the value i guess a, a sort of pecking order you know of who's valued so you know employed you know clearly sort of held up with this you know kind of paying 80 percent of, of of wages um, you know, there's, there's been there's been a huge amount. I think it's like three million that have fallen through and have not been paid anything. You know, those are kind of like sort of self-employed freelancers. You know, there's a, there's a lot of people who've who've totally sort of fallen through the net and have. Gosh, have I wonder. Sort of how many, yeah, I wonder how many didn't get it figured out here. Mm, Curious. It's, it's probably probably quite a lot, I would imagine. Yeah. Um, I think, I mean, I mean, the other thing, like, as we, as we, um, you know, sort of get, I mean, you, you made a, a sort of career shift. I think we, we sort of touched on that, on that sort of last time I said career shift. You sort of moved into, into sort of real, real estate. So you basically, you know, kind of had, you know, a bunch of skills that you knew you could apply in the real estate in, a, in another sector, which, you know, sort of real estate. Mm -hmm. um, I think my, my kind of take is that a lot of people, as, as they get older, um, now clearly, if, you know, if you, there's a, there's a kind of risk in doing that. You have to kind of retrain and, you know, go into an environment that, that you're not, not used to. Mm -hmm. um, and I think for, for a lot of people, there's a, there's a, as they get older, there's a um, reluctance to take risks, you know, kind of keep the status quo, mm -hmm. you know? Um, but I think that, that that is perhaps going to need to change. Uh, you know, most people won't do a major change unless they don't have a choice. Yeah. Right. Very few people go, I've been doing that for a while. It's pretty mm. good. What else we got? You know, it's yeah. just, that, that is not the safe approach. Mm. Mm. Um, and I think I'm definitely in the smaller category of people who yeah. are pretty enthusiastic about change. And yeah. I am the kind of person that will go, all right, I'm getting kind of bored of that. I need to do something, need to do something else. else. Yeah. And so for me, that uh, it took me a while to realize that that people mm. are very, very reluctant to mm. change. Um, I think with the pandemic, people were forced to mm. either find creative approaches to the current job they had, or creative ways to bring in money that wasn't what they were trained in or had been doing in the past. And I yeah. think that. One, that is, you know, sure, there's the shot in the arm from the vaccination, but I think the entire world got a shot in the arm of creative necessity, yeah. right? 
Um, and what is it? Necessity is the mother of invention. Yeah. Um, yeah. People had to reinvent themselves or the definition of their current job really fast yeah. if they wanted to survive. And I think that that is a wonderful side effect of the pandemic. I agree. Yeah. The hybrid yeah. work model, like fuck off, man. Everybody does not have to go sit in a shitty office just to mm. be online all day. Absolutely. Absolutely like, right. That yeah. makes no sense. So of course, what are we going to do with all these empty offices? Manager, middle management just pretty much disappeared. Disappears. Yeah. Which I don't, did anybody like being middle management? I mean, couldn't there do something else? Yeah. They probably of... did. I'm sorry, middle managers, if you're happy doing that. <laughs> me, that sounds like the, you've got people below you and people above you, and you've just got such a narrow path. Um, interesting. But also maybe for some people that that's really comforting. Mm. You just have this, this is my lane and mm. I stay in my lane and this is the jobs that I dole out to the people below me. And these are the things that I answer to, to the people above me. And I, I know my role. Mm. So, and that's why the, you know, that there's people that could be happy. I mean, in that kind of a job, right? I mean, in, in, in a way, I mean, I mean, you, you've benefited from, um, you know, kind of working in a in a in a band in particular, uh, but also in an industry, but mainly the band that has been very creative and experimental and prepared to to take risks. You know, all all the way through your your career, um, yeah. and you know, you know that's that's a that's a mindset, isn't it? You know, that's that's kind of what you what you are. Constant creative solutions where there is no template, right? Mm -hmm. You yeah. don't you don't just do what the other person did. I mean. Yeah. Sometimes you're lucky enough when somebody blazed some sort of trail that you can see. Um, yeah, and you're you're working with so many different kinds of personalities. Mm. Um, and yes, the the stuff that the secret agent McCabe stuff that I did for the dandies absolutely helped me yeah. do real estate. Yeah, I mean the the um, uh, the. Did, did you get that sort of feeling that you you kind of uh, there's this great book um by hook and it's called uh paddling uh, paddling against the flow mm -hmm. you know which is about you know that means you know artists musicians um you know big you know skateboarders big kind of variety of people um who have done this you know so there's like sort of ken gordon most deaf rollins for example you know, and and it's about you know that that feeling that you are pushing. You know, you you're going against the flow. And you were saying earlier that you know the band, you know, they produce. The, there's a lot of guitars going on around, so you produce synth record. Mm -hmm. And that 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 feeling of going against the tide. Mm -hmm. I mean, did did that at a, at any stage sort of weigh you down, or you know that constant? I mean, because you must have come into kind of like a bit of conflict with labels as to as to what they expect or want yeah. from you. well well <laughs> how do you deal with that even in a creative industry once you get dealing with major labels it doesn't feel like you're in a creative industry anymore it mm. still feels like people want you to fit into some sort of category mm. and so that they can market you and so they can you know which section on the record shelf do you go yeah yeah, yeah it felt mm. like it was frustrating you know mm. it, it, it we were constantly you know, two years ahead of the curve or four years behind it. Like we never were on trend mm. by design, right? Mm. But also, yeah, that sucked because all of these like square thinking people, these are a bunch of square pegs and round holes, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. These should be round pegs helping us, but yeah. they're not. And so does not compute, does not conform. They didn't know how to market us. They didn't know mm. how to, and they didn't have the creative bandwidth <laughs> or the support from their superiors to go out of the margins. Mm. Um, so cre uh, college radio killed it because mm. they're not conforming to uh, you know the same things that mainstream radio is. And yeah, we, we felt that a lot. Um, going upstream swimming against the current is exhausting right mm -hmm. and that's conforming is easier show me my lane i'll stay in it i don't have to think about work after 5 p.m let me go home to my family and when you're yeah. when you're swimming upstream you can never stop paddling yeah 
because you will just sail downstream. Sail back down again. Start over. Mm. So yeah, you know, always that's why they those sayings are like swimming upstream and blazing your own trail. And, you know, that's why those things are that is because it is a it's a harder path because there's no path, right? Yeah, <laughs> we, yeah, yeah, you exactly. You really have to find your own way. And all you can do are look for clues from other people who created their own path mm. with the similar obstacles that you're facing. Mm. And so you are constantly looking. It's like when I first got in the band, I watched every single VH1 behind the music because like you said, if you're going to be a lawyer, you know how you you go to the school to be a lawyer, you take the test to be a lawyer, you be a lawyer, you know what it's going to be like. Mm. Somebody can tell you exactly what it's like to be a lawyer. People can't tell you and how to become one. People can't tell you how to become a successful musician or artist. Yeah. There is no one set. There is no one path. All mm. you can do is look for clues of pitfalls to avoid and shortcuts that you can take and things that help you pick yourself back up when you feel defeated. Yeah, and yeah. those are the clues. And so like every VH1 behind the music had a nugget, a little thing for me to go, a note to self, a yeah, little yeah. takeaway. And you compile as many of those as you can mm. to you know use as needed going through this. Like you're just, it's just so much, it's so foggy compared to other you know ways yeah, to live other you're, ways to live yeah. yeah you're just sort of confused and you don't know which way to turn and you don't know which way is going to be the best way because there's no you just look back on things and try to adjust for the next one that comes forward mm. and i think that some people that would make them so incredibly miserable that mm. they would avoid this lifestyle at all costs yeah and that's the thing that i didn't understand at the beginning i thought everybody wished they were me yeah that I had won the rock and roll lottery and I had the best life. And I did, I mean, I did have the, I mean, this has been an amazing, amazing life and I have made the most of it and enjoyed the fuck out of it. But it took me quite a while, quite a while to realize that it's so not for everyone. It's it funny, I, I, um, I don't know if you know, if you know um, Martin Atkins, who's the, he's the first drummer in public uh, second drummer in public image he drummed on flowers of mm. romance oh, okay. he's, he's, he's a um basically like a um he teaches music business up at millican university in, in illinois and um he, he's, he's incredible and, and one of his things is i think he's done i think it's a book it's either a book or a or a series anyway it's basically welcome to the music business you're fucked and that's 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 kind of it that's like yeah. the, the bible class. i have <laughs> taught class. you every I've taught you everything I know. Good luck. What did you think you signed up for a class? There's no class for this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. That's exactly that's exactly right. But for me, I wouldn't have it any other way. And sure. I do feel yeah. like I really got to apply that sense of creative problem solving um, and thinking outside the box to my real estate business. Absolutely, and yeah. It's really, really proved incredible. I mean, I'm in one of the toughest um, industries yeah, right now sure. and, and I'm doing really well and mm. I'm getting rockers into houses that never thought they could own a house and I'm doing yeah. it by being really creative with the solutions and the offers I write and the houses I find. Mm. And if I was a more um, by the book in the box thinker, Mm. these guys would still be looking for houses and yeah. that's what has that's been really empowering to I, this is my own business there's nobody yeah. tells me how to do any of it I have yeah. colleagues that I rely on for advice and to you know brainstorm with but really I'm just kind of out there making it happen for these clients on my own and it's like scary and exhausting but also just so rewarding yeah, to, yeah. to the victories that I've been able to yeah. secure I think I think I think what you've done is incredible. I think you, you know, sort of using the you know the creative, like you say, that you know exactly that the creativity in it and the 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 kind of the learning that you've had, but also that you you had that kind of business knowledge and you made yourself learn the business, mm -hmm. you know, for the band, and then mm -hmm. you've you basically kind of like sort of fused the two together, you know, to to be able to think creatively, but with the the business 
knowledge and that might sound easy but it's difficult to that's really difficult to do right? so i think yeah i mean i'm I'm honing, I'm honing it every day right yeah, yeah, yeah. constantly making adjustments and a lot of times i feel like out of you know in over my head and yeah. um there's there's something you do that enough and you you get kind of comfortable with that feeling of like it's trusting yourself right yeah, yeah. you you develop a sense of trust that you've figured it out enough times that when you're standing there going i don't know what to do i don't know what the answer is i don't know where to find the answer i can at least stop and go you know what your track record is great for this yeah, yeah. You were really good at finding these answers. So just chill the fuck out because you're gonna figure this one out too. Yeah. Yeah. And you you get and that that must be the mindset for entrepreneurs because I have no interest in starting business after business after business. Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. But I, yeah. I can do it, you know. So like right now I'm getting into investment properties. And so mm -hmm. I'm I'm a noob again. I don't know what I'm doing. I can't see the path yeah. in front of me. I don't know how to do it, but I know I've got some money set aside and I know that I figured everything else out up to this point. So it's just a matter of time before I've taken enough baby steps to where all of a sudden yeah. I have the keys to my first investment property. And yeah. then you go from there. But that sense of being new and confused and not knowing what you're doing is almost the the, the place that artists live in perpetually, right? Mm -hmm. Or or I do, maybe other artists feel like I do all the time. <laughs> I, 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 think, I think you're right. <laughs> I mean, I think that bands that make, you know, a formula and once they have, a, I can see the attraction to having formulaic music mm. because they're, they've got their lane, they've established yeah. it and now you just keep doing it and it feels good because it's comfortable. You know, it's why people run the same jogging trail, even though they could take a different one. There's yeah. people who want to run the same trail and then there's people who always want to see a new trail. Yeah. And I think yeah. my band is the new trail kind mm. of band. Yeah. Um, Though I do see the attraction to the other kind, not so much listening because I feel like I'm just hearing the same thing over and over, but um, I see that that attraction as an artist to have figured out their own individual formula and yeah. they want to stay in their lane. This is what we do. Okay. And, and people like that. I, I don't think any of the people in my band would be happy with that process. I think you, I think you're right. <laughs> Zia, that's brilliant. Thank you. Um, that's brilliant. I think we've uh, we covered. We, I think we covered those two questions, haven't we? I think we just barely did. I'll see you for installment number three. Yes. <laughs> brilliant. Thanks so much, Zia. I really appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, I'm glad we got a chance to reconnect. Yeah, definitely. It's been great. All right. Good. Take care, Good. then. I'll see you soon. See you next time. <laughs>